Ladies and gentlemen, the chess game that I am about to show you very well might be the best chess game played in 2023, but it very well could be one of the best chess games played ever, at least in some of the last few decades. This is a game played at the European Team Chess Championship, which just finished in Montenegro. And it was played between Grandmaster Nicolas Theodoru from Greece and Temur Rajabov from Azerbaijan. And I am on my last day of my traveling setup, hotel. I'll be back in New York City tomorrow. One last fan event here, book signing in London. Very excited to see the folks that are coming out tonight. Friends, uh, look, you know, there is a common theme at times to embellish the truth, exaggerate the truth, clickbait, if you will. But this game, literally, without exaggeration, was 100% accurate. If you run this game through chess.com's game review at one of the higher depths, it is considered a 100% accurate game with four brilliant moves. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing is an understatement. <laughs> Here we go. So, Nicholas Theodoru. Uh, by the way, I played Nicholas multiple times uh, in my journey to becoming a grandmaster. Uh, he, we drew uh, twice, I think, and he beat me once. Uh, and um, he started this game with e4, which he has never played against me. Against me, he's always played knight f knight f3 on the first move, and, and he plays some d4, but he plays e4 in this game. And so remember, the moves of this game are incredible, but what didn't happen, what could have happened, and what details laid or lied under the surface was equally fascinating. So his opponent, Rajabov, uh, responded with e5. And knight f3, and now Rajabov has to make the second big decision of the game, which is do I play a regular knight c6, inviting an Italian or a Spanish, or do I play the Petrov with knight to f6? Do I mirror, right? Do I play the Russian defense? Uh, or do I play the Latvian gambit? I don't know. Uh, he plays knight f6. So we have a Petrov, right? And the Petrov is a symmetrical system uh, where white takes on e5 and then gets kicked out of the center and then takes the pawn back. And, you know, many, 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 many games of chess have been played there, as well as many games in the Stafford Gambit, which is refuted uh, at GM level, not at intermediate or, frankly, even advanced level. Uh, but Theodoro plays a sideline. So Theodoro does not take on e5. Clearly, he had something in mind, and uh, he uncorks it already as early as move three, which is this move d4. Like, this... this this is a, a very big sideline, but it's very, very powerful, very venomous. And basically, black does not get what black wants in a Petrov. Black in a Petrov just wants like a very solid center and easy development. With this, it's just, you know, Theodoro just basically, you know, sets off some fireworks in the middle of the street. So now if you take this pawn, white will push this pawn forward. And, and black doesn't really want that because then black is going to go here and quickly develop everything. So instead of that, Rajabov takes on e4. He takes on e4, and historically, white then will develop the bishop, and then take back the pawn, and then castle. That's what, that's what, and there's a funny line here, knight c6, where black hangs the knight, but ends up forking white like this. It's kind of a funny line. Um, so knight takes e4, and instead of that, Theodoro plays this move. So Theodoro is going deeper and deeper into his bag of tricks. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's not playing the main line, which is knight takes pawn in the center. He's playing uh, d4, and then instead of playing bishop to d3, he's playing d takes e5. And there is nothing really wrong with the move d takes e5. It's a very forcing line, and it's forcing because black's, you know, potentially best option now is to develop his bishop here, threatening this pawn, which is actually not protect the bull in an easy way. Black could also take the center, but Rajabov plays bishop c5. So Rajabov spends seven minutes already, clearly surprised by the opening, right? Clearly just maybe get remembering things that he's analyzed, you know? And he plays bishop c5, which is a very natural move, but what makes this position so delicate and dangerous for black, not for white, is the fact that these pieces are loose. And frequently, in the opening, if you try to just do a lot of damage within the first five moves, you overextend. You leave everybody behind. Because the way the chessboard is set up, when two pieces just go off running, the rest of the, rest of the team is back here, right? We lose our defenders. Like in any sport, team sport. So now Theodora plays bishop c4. 
which is certainly a move. Um, the other move here is queen d5 immediately, and there is a line here where black takes with check and then just guards the knight in the center, and white threatens checkmate on f7, black defends, and then kicks out white's pieces, and black is doing very well. Instead of entering that line, Theodoru plays something better, which is bishop c4, and he walks directly into this fork. So it looks like Theodoru is just losing, right? And it also looks like if he plays queen d5, forking the bishop in this, black just defends both. Well, brilliant move number one. This one loosely granted by the chess.com game review, but this is part of the preparation, and um, the fireworks begin very quickly in this game. Nicholas Theodoru in this position plays bishop takes f7, sacrificing a full bishop, sacrificing a full bishop to seize the momentum of the game and lure this king out into being attacked and into being attacked and also into no longer being uh, a fork for white, right? So if black says, no, I don't want it, then white will play queen to d2, give up the rook and bring the queen opposite the king. And it is going to be a very, very unpleasant situation for black who now probably has to run the king to e7, at which point, you know, we will play here and try to checkmate the king. <laughs> it's going to be a very funny, very uh, fun game, right? Bishop h5, you know, you will try to defend yourself, and then I will play here, and the king is just butchered to death in the center of the board. Um, so instead of that, Rajabov takes. He understands it's the best move. White's queen zips into the center of the board, threatening the king and the bishop. That's an empty square, and the bishop. And now the king walks out to g6. Now, you will notice that Stockfish evaluates this position as equal. Yes. But there is a difference between an equal position that is normal and an equal position that requires both players to walk the plank. You know, like off of a pirate ship, you walk the plank? This is what you have to do. And any small misstep, and that's it, right? You just... And well, technically, when you walk the plank in a pirate ship, they don't... I mean, you get pushed off anyway, so I don't really... Why don't they just throw you overboard? Anyway, whatever. Pirates are inefficient. Um, they should use uh, corporate, uh, corporate communication systems like Slack or something. Uh, anyway... Now if you take the bishop, you lose your rook. So you obviously can't do that. You should probably bring your rook first, and then... Nope. Brilliant move number two. Sacrificing the rook in the corner of the board. And black takes it. So, we've played some chess. We've played eight moves each. That's it. <laughs> eight moves. Feels like, you know, it feels like we've played ten, mo uh, <laughs> ten moves. Uh, Twenty moves each. It, I mean, how is this even possible? Like, look at this position. So, why does a full rook down? Full rook. Both sides have two knights and a bishop, but one side just has two rooks. What black wants now is to play h6 and king h7. That's it. That's what black wants. To cover g5 and to hide the king. What does white want? White wants to get the knight. Bishop into the game, white wants to play queen c4 and go after the king, and when white castles, this knight is as good as dead, but it's going to take a little bit of time to get that, and in that time, black will hide the king, black will bring the rook, and black will play d6 and get these pieces into the game. So black is just moments away. Everything in this game is determined by one step. White plays knight c3. So white develops, looks for knight d5, which would get the rook back, or get knight e7, right? And Rajabo spends a little time and plays h6. Now, in this position, about 80% of the games go queen c4. And keep in mind, this is, again, everything Theodoro has done from the very beginning. In this position, about, you know, let's say 70-80% of games go knight takes pawn. In this position, about 70 or 80% of the games go bishop d3. We keep moving, and I just said, in 70 to 80% of the games played here, white goes queen c4 to try to go there. But Theodoro plays this. And on low depth, look at that, on low depth, low stockfish depth, it thinks this is a mistake. So if you run game review on like baby browser, that move is considered an inaccuracy. But if you run game review on chess.com on high depth, it thinks that move is the best move. One of the two best moves, tied. And this move has only been played a few times. And it's basically setting up various ideas. The ideas are, again, threatening this. The ideas are knight to e7 check, queen c4, queen e4. Some of you might know the talented US junior player Alice Lee. I think she is like the youngest woman to get the international master title recently, like achieved. She had a game where she played black here and she played rookie eight in this position. And, um,. I just got like violently attacked. I mean, I think I think it was something like this, this, and like bishop takes h6. It was something completely crazy. Like I, I don't remember the exact move order, but she was just under a massive attack, and then the knight got to f6, and it was it was brutal. Um, it might have been 
uh, like queen c4. It was like queen c4, rook e8, queen e4, yes. It was like this, bishop takes h6, and, and Alice Lee just got obliterated because she just mixed up her move order, and that's the dangerous thing. Like, if you're going to juggle sticks that are on fire, there's a chance you'll burn your house down. <laughs> so don't do that, please. Uh, you know, uh, advice here with Gotham Chess. So in this game, uh, rook e8 was played by Rajabov to stop knight to e7, and now we have queen to d4. And so... Theodorus' idea is to now transfer the pieces this way, and knight f6, and bishop takes h6. Remember, he has made two brilliant moves, and so far he has played absolutely perfectly, and he has 33 minutes up on the clock. Now, Rajabov at any point could get his knight into the game, but he fulfills the king's destiny and runs the king to safety. And now, he will play d6, knight c6, etc., etc., Looks like we are about to have a moment of stability. In this position, though, Nicholas Theodoro plays. Bishop takes h6! His third brilliant move. How is this even possible? Not the brilliancy. How? What does that move even do? And you start realizing, oh, if black takes with the pawn, which is actually what happens in the game, I will show you what's about to happen. If black takes with the king, it doesn't even, doesn't even look like there's a clear solution. If black takes with the king, queen e3 check forces the king back. Then you play knight g5 check, forcing the king back. And then you play queen f4, threatening queen f7. And there is no way to stop it. Rook f8, there is this. And there is no way to stop it. Because all of black's pieces are like on the starting ranks. So Black's got all these pieces and a horse that just walked to the other side of town. <laughs> the horse decided I'm walking off the farm. I'm going to go to the town square and buy a train ticket. <laughs> the horse is, I don't even know what it's doing. Right. So the craziest thing is this is just lost. Like if you take with the king, you lose. If you take with the pawn, the position's still balanced. The best move here is knight c6, just ignoring. Now white would play queen f4, threatening queen f5, knight g5, and queen f7. Black would play this. Now you have queen g4, and something takes on h6, and the game, if played perfectly, will end in a draw, according to the computer. So if black defends this position perfectly, the game is a draw. Bishop takes h6. If black plays knight c6, allows the queen to rotate, and finds a way to defend perfectly, black makes a draw. But he takes. Now, the incredible thing about this move is that it's a double question mark, and yet the position is equal. How is that possible? It's because browser-based stockfish does not see what's coming. It's not queen e4 check. You don't rush. It's actually incredible. The winning move in this position for white, after sacrificing the bishop to open up the king, it's not knight f6 check because then you'll get taken and you're pinned. The best move in this position, the only move that wins for white, the best move is long castles. Sitting there, down seven points of material and just castling your king. And the idea is that now knight f6 is a monster threat, a huge threat. As well as queen e4, as well as just taking the knight, as well as just playing rook f1 and getting the rook into the game. Now in this position, black can play knight c6, can play rook e6, and even though this computer cannot realize it, the game is over. In the game, Rajava played rook e6, and his idea was to meet knight f6 with either a sacrifice or a defense of his pawn. He just wanted to make sure his pawn was protected, and then he would play this and this and bring the queen. Um, the best move might have also been knight c6 now. The winning sequence here is so brutal. The winning sequence goes like this. Queen e4 check... The king slides to h8. The king could also slide to g7, and it's going to lead to the same thing. It's going to lead to check and here. So king here, queen here. The pawn is threatened, and you want to play knight g5. But how do you deal with rook e7? You can't take it, because then if you take, black brings the queen and protects the king. Well, you also cannot play knight f6, because after this, you have nothing. Not only do you have nothing, you are lost. So you know what you do before you play knight f6? You sacrifice the other knight! 
Knight, you don't take the pawn with check. You stop rook to h7. And if your knight gets captured, the h-file is open for business. Now knight to f6 is winning, because after queen f8, queen h5, it's a geometric checkmate. King g7, mate. The difference when the queen was here is that there's, there's no check. So you have to play knight to g5 first. That is the winning idea. It is absolutely brutal. And now queen g8 is the best defense, after which you take, you take the rook, and you just come back. And black is completely defenseless. Black is completely defenseless. There's just nothing black can do. Because you can just take, you can put your knight here, you can get your rook in, and you're just winning. Knight c6 would have led to one of the most absurd fit. Knight to g5, opening up the h file, and if you don't take the Trojan horse on h5, then I just play knight f6. So for example, queen f8. I, I mean, I can take the rook as well. Like, that's that, that's ultimately my threat. So if rook g7, you have this. Take here, knight f6, you know, here. Then you go here, and to h8, and it's just over. Um, but rook e6 was played in the game. Knight f6 was played, and now... Rajabov could have played rook f6, but he went for king h8 instead, which is losing. Um, had he taken this line, which wins for white, is bananas. So pay attention. Had Rajabov taken the knight and allowed this, white is now threatening queen e4 or queen g6, right? So if black plays, let's say, knight c6, white will play queen e4, and then we'll play queen g6, and then we'll win the game by playing rook e1 and rook e8 and f7. Like, you can't be stopped. So, black would try to sneak out. Whoa, black is trying to sneak out. And if you take the knight, then there's queen f6. So the best move here for white is to slide. You can't play queen f2 because queen f6 is to slide the rook to e1 to go rook e7. But then black would play knight c6. But then you would play queen f4 to try to push the pawn. Black would play d6 and then bishop d7 to try to stop the pawn from queening and then rook e8! Rook to e8! Disconnecting the queen from the promotion square and then black would have to sacrifice his queen because if he doesn't, it's not f8, it's check. And I force the king onto a dark square and then I checkmate by promotion. This is... <laughs> These are some of the hidden lines in this game that could have happened. Rajambov could have tried to sneak out with the knight. Being like, oh, oh, you gotta take me, look, my knight is coming into the game. But he would have been ignored because he has a rectangle of pieces that are not doing anything, right? This is 24 points of material standing in a box that hasn't been touched. Half of the pieces that he starts the game with haven't moved. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So instead of that, after knight f6, he played king to h8. But now white has one and only one winning move. Knight to h4. And I think at this point, Theodoro must have been thinking, wow, I'm going to end up in another Gotham video. That's like four or five. I mean, I must be second or third place to Magnus and Hikaru. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like between all of my recaps and some of Theodoro's games, that's what he must have been thinking about. Not the fact that, you know, I'm going to beat a 2750 GM in like 10 moves. Knight to h4 threatening, knight to g6 check, as well as queen f4, as well as all, all sorts of things. Black plays pawn to d6, trying to fight back, and Theodoro plays the one and the only move. See, if Theodoro rushes in and gets hit with this, the knight is hanging. So then if he plays queen g4, all of a sudden he is actually losing. Right? He's just losing because both knights hang and the queen hangs. Rook g5. So he's got to handle this with care, and he does. Queen f4. Who's going to protect the pawn? That's mate. Queen, queen h is checkmate. Qu checkmate. Rajabov plays king g7. The best move there, according to the computer, was to lose your queen. But this is not a move that a person can voluntarily play. King g7. Queen g4 check. King goes back to the corner. Knight g6. And the fourth... And final, brilliant move, which just so happens to end the game. Knight to f8 check. Discover check. If you take queen g8, queen g7. Black did not use half of his starting back pieces in this game. Half. He didn't use these three pawns. I mean, this this barely counts. <laughs> this knight greedily walked into the white position and never moved again. Knight to f8 check, 19 moves. 
by Nicholas Theodoro, defeats 2750 rated Timur Rajabov, who's a perennial top 10 player, former top five player in the world, was 2800 at some point, 100% accuracy. I am not exaggerating. The four brilliant moves are, you know, you can debate because some are in the opening, they don't count. He played a perfect game. Not only did he play a perfect game, look at the amount of time that he started with. It's 130. They start with 130. It's just they get 51 here according to chess.com. It's like a weird small thing. Uh, I don't know why it's like that. Theodoro spent one minute and six seconds on this game from his starting time. 66 seconds, four brilliant moves, 100% accuracy win. I, <laughs> I'm going to go because I, I can't do I This is just making me sad. So uh, I'll see you all tomorrow. Get out of here.